but of course it doesn't have, I'm rambling, my God, okay. <coughs> Trying that again. Hey there, Cousin here, and welcome back to Always Doing. Today I'm coming at you with the first part of my June wrap-up. May ended up only having one part because while I did finish two more books, one was for the Booktube Prize, and the other one I'm going to start talking about right about now. It's Flowers from the Storm by Laura Kinsale. Kinsale's one of the big names of old school romance, and this is her most well-known, most well-admired, most well-loved book and it's been on my list as something that's part of the if there is a romance canon as part of it and but you know got to be in the right mood for old schools right but a discord group i'm in decided to do a group read and i was like oh okay okay i'm in and it's about a lot kinsale burns through so much plot in this book that it's kind of hard to describe what's going on in any kind of succinct way, but our heroine is Maddie, she is Quaker, which ends up being a big thing throughout the book, and um, her father is a mathematician, and the Dirk of Dirk, Duke of Gervaux is also a mathematician. They're working together on a thing, but while this is happening, she's met the Duke like once. He's very handsome, he's dashing, he's known as a rake, he's also mathematically brilliant. Uh, something happens to him and he ends up being put into an asylum, by his family and she decides it's her job to go in there and basically save him and somehow get him out because the conditions as you can guess are not very good what i think is interesting and this is not a spoiler because it's obvious on the page from the beginning is that the duke of gervaux has had a stroke and we know that as modern readers but of course at the time they had no real conception of that it just looked like he went mad all of a sudden i mean of course it helped that there was a duel going on like there's a there's a lot going on here and I found the first part of this book interesting, mostly because it's messy people trying to get through bad situations, which is totally my jam. However, as things went on, people create, as in people outside the main couple mostly, though also within it, create unnecessary strife, unnecessary situations, there's some miscommunication, it's all this stuff that can happen in old school. And I'm really glad I did this as a book read, group read, can't speak today because there were people like when I got frustrated and I was like, I don't know if I can continue on with this. If I was reading this mono, I might have DNF'd it by now. And they were like, no, go, go on. There's one bad bit here, but it gets better. That reassurance was super helpful. There were also some Kinsale super fans in the group, which helped. And there are problematic bits. There's a lot of content notes as well, um, as you can probably guess from the little bit of plot I told you. And I'm mostly thankful to have this under my belt. And to say I've read it, it's definitely not the worst old school I've ever read. Definitely not. Hello, Flame in the Flower. I have a whole vlog I did while I was reading it because it's just that bad. That was also a group read. Thank goodness. That was a buddy read. But yeah, um, I'm glad I have it done. Glad I read it with friends. And maybe I'll try some other Kinsale at some point. But I, at least I know what mood I need to be in before I read it. The first book I finished in June proper was Blank Canvas by E.M. Lindsay. It is the second book in their Irons and Works series. And I will say, if you decide to go into this series, it would behoove you not to leave a year between books like I did, because at least for these first two, there's a bit of overlap in time. Like this book begins about halfway through book one. And so it was okay, but I had to remind myself who people were and I'm like, oh wait, was that the hero from book one or was that a side character from book one? What's going on? And like I said, it was fine but it would have been even more enjoyable and I would have probably cottoned on to a lot more interesting side character stuff if I had read it closer to finishing the end of book one. One of the heroes of this book is Nico. He's an ex-hockey player. He actually got up to his first NHL game and was injured pretty bad. It wasn't his fault. There was some faulty equipment and it ended up finishing his career even though he only spent like a minute on the ice. And he got a large settlement from that and is trying to figure out what to do now. Like he went back to school, he got his accounting degree, he likes the accounting, but it's not how he wants to spend the rest of his life and he doesn't have any place where he's really felt like home. The other hero is Sam. He is a tattoo artist at this shop. He uses a wheelchair because he was paralyzed from about the waist down uh, when he was 15 from a car accident. And he has adopted a daughter, a, a girl I should say, from somebody in his family, basically the mom whom he was related to, died and the father ended up in jail, not a great guy, and no one wanted to take her, so he decided that he would adopt her and has been raising her for the past three years. She is now four. And he's trying to finalize the adoption and to get everything in order, but the 
child protection people are putting him through so many hoops, mostly because he's in a wheelchair and they don't believe that he can take care of her, even though that's exactly what he's been doing for the past three years. These two meet, there's obviously a spark, but Nico ends up wanting to put his foot in his mouth for some stupid things he says. And Sam is like, look, I am going through all this custody shit right now. This is not a time for a relationship. And, but they decide maybe we can just have some sex and see what happens and you can guess how that goes. What I love about these books and what Lindsay does is that, first of all, so many of the characters are from marginalized groups and they all come together as a chosen family, as a found family in a really profound way that feels wonderful. But also most of the trauma is in the past. Like we hear about the um, hockey accident and the car crash, that's all happened years ago. And the players, the players, the characters are dealing with the after effects and just trying to go on and be their best selves and to find love and the rest. And that journey is healing and there's usually a bad guy. I mean, you can guess from the adoption story who the bad guy is going to be. Um, and you know, they get their comeuppance, everything comes out for love in the end. And it just, it feels warm and fuzzy <laughs> despite all of the content notes, which I'll have linked down below like I always do in wrap ups. So. I actually didn't make a big review for this on Goodreads. I didn't feel like I could. It's a solid three stars for me, mostly because I am turning away from contemporary romance at the moment. It's just not, I need more escapist stuff. I've been reading a lot more historical. I've been wanting to get back into science fiction and stuff. So it's not necessarily Lindsay's fault that I'm giving this three stars, but it was very, it's very good. It's very good for what it is. And I do want to continue on in the series hopefully sooner rather than later. The next book I read in two sittings, but those two sittings were like three weeks apart. It's Japanese manga where the title is Hachini no Senshi. In English, it's been translated as Dick Fight Island and it's by Ike Reibun. I first heard about this book from Laura over at Laura's Library Card and she gave a pretty succinct review of it. And I thought when I read it, I'd be able to have so much more to say. I'm not so sure. The plot is very much off the wall. We have um, a, like an island country, like with like an archipelago of some sort, and every island has a completely different culture and they all send a man to this one place to all fight, which I will get to, uh, in order to become the ruler of the entire, you know, eight island country for a couple of years. And the way that they fight is basically the first man to come loses. So in order to prevent that from happening, that's why they developed this um, armor for themselves. I should just take this off. That's why they developed this armor to help prevent them from coming. And yeah, it's, it's all right. And what's interesting is that I read this in Japanese and Japanese censorship laws are different from what's in the West. And so basically anywhere there would be a member, let's say, was just white. So you had characters grasping white air and mysterious fluid shooting out from nothingness. But in the English tradition, it's, that's not, it's there. It's all there. And uh, sometimes there's like little sensor bars that are more of a joke than anything else. And I think that's an important thing to understand is that this book does not take itself seriously. It's all rather silly. And I don't know, I've seen some people who are like, this has so much depth and world building. And I don't think so. It relies on a trait or two for each one of the islands and then takes it to its logical conclusion. And yeah, there's another volume. I think it's just a duology. I'm not going to bother reading on. I'm good. And something that struck me as interesting is that in Japanese, so there's 2000 kanji characters that are used in everyday writing. Uh, adults tend to know closer to 3000, but they have several readings each. So when it's a rare reading, when it's a weird reading, if it's a character that's not used very much, they'll add the reading on top in hiragana. And if something's for younger readers, they'll just put the hiragana on everything because they assume that they can't read very many kanji at all. This has hiragana on all of the kanji, even the most simple stuff on every instance, which I thought is interesting because this is not aimed at kids at all. Is it to reduce the mental load while you read your porn without plot? I, I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. 
So yeah, again, not that much to say. You might find it interesting. Apparently it's making the rounds on TikTok and such. So yeah, if you have been hanging around the channel for any length of time, you probably know that I love Erica Ridley. She writes historical romance. Her book, The Perks of Loving a Wallflower, which I'll link a full review to up here, was one of my favorite books of all last year. And the next book in that series, the Wild Winchester series, is coming out in July and it's called Nobody's Princess. I received this as an advanced copy, Thank You Forever, and this is tough for me because I love the Winchesters. We have a whole bunch of siblings that were all orphans and adopted by one baron, Baron Winchester. And they, even though they look nothing alike, they're all different skin tones, they have different sexualities, they're all different types of people, they've all come together as this family and do heists and try and fix the wrongs of the world. It's great stuff. And in the beginning of this book, I fell right back into that. The banter is there. I fell in love with our hero and heroine. The hero I knew already because that's Graham Winchester. He was in a circus when he was very young with his mom and he was brought up to be like an acrobat, like tightrope, trapeze type sort. And um, something didn't go very well and he ended up being orphaned and adopted by Baron Winchester and knew him from previous books. The heroine is Kunigunde. She is the companion to a princess of a fictional country, but she wants to be in the Royal Guard. That is her goal. Her family has been Royal Guardsmen forever. She wants to be the first woman to make it. She has been training her whole life, like doing everything her brothers are doing, but she's a girl, so they won't let her. But she has decided to go off to England on a trip to gather information like a royal guardsman would do to prove her worth and then she'll go back to her country and they'll have no choice but to make her a guardsman, which would make her very happy. While she's going around hunting for information, she ends up crossing paths with Graham because they're looking for the same information and things will go from there. I like these two, especially Kuni because she learned English as a second language and then in this book is visiting a country where that language is primarily spoken for the first time. And there was a bunch of relatable stuff there for me as someone who learned Japanese in the United States and then ended up coming here to Japan and just being overwhelmed by how quickly people speak at times, by words like phrases, idioms that you may have never heard before, that kind of thing. And I love how the Winchesters were very kind to her and never like look exasperated or annoyed that they had to rephrase stuff sometimes. I thought that was all great. And the heist this time is about labor and factory conditions and how in places where they were like spinning cotton thread or weaving or whatever, they would have kids work 12, 16 hours a day, um, inhumane conditions, paying wages that are very, very low. And so the Winchesters end up going into one of these factories basically to try and fix everything because they tried laws first and the law, the parliament thing didn't work out so clearly. So they ended up having to take another route. Normally I like the heists in these Winchester books, but this one, some of this stuff took up too much room and too much page space in the beginning. And here, like the romance suffered because when they were off doing heist stuff, more often than not, it separated Cooney and Graham. So instead of the heist bringing them together, it was like, oh, you're off, you know, gathering information for said heist. I have to go off to this other place and they would be apart. And like, yes, absence makes the heart grow fonder. But in a romance, I want to see the relationship development on the page and it just wasn't there. And I was just waiting for plot in general once we got through that first quarter or third. It's like, okay, what is this all going to revolve around? What is their aim? What are they going for? Like I said, especially in a romance, I want to see everybody working towards the same goal it's not really there and I kept on waiting for it to kick in waiting it just doesn't kick in it just doesn't and it I'm not I would I didn't care for this very much at all which makes me very sad because like I said I love the Winchesters so yeah no it's like two and a half stars that was a bummer and then I ended up DNFing a book by an author I love because the book just wasn't working for me and I was like okay I need to jump ship from romance for a little bit I want somebody to tell me something that's real, nonfiction, please, and not with my eyes. So I ended up picking up an audiobook, Fascism, A Warning by Madeleine Albright. I have been reading a bunch about fascism and authoritarianism and all the related movements and things. I did a whole video on where to start when reading books about fascism. This seemed like a natural fit. It came out in 2018, so halfway through the Trump presidency. And what is so interesting about this is if you don't know, Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State in the United States under President Clinton. 
and so she and she her family has been affected by fascism they actually um, were refugees from Czechoslovakia to the United States in around World War II and so she has this personal experience she has professional experience she was a professor teaching this kind of stuff she knows her shit to say the least and in the beginning of this book she explains what fascism is she goes into her personal history and then each chapter in the beginning here is about a different fascist person character in history so Hitler and Mussolini and then she slowly brings it up to more modern folks so she talks about Putin and she talks about Erdogan in Turkey and she talks about is it the law and order movement in Poland and all of these things and because she was secretary of state during a peaceful rather technically not technically relatively peaceful time uh she has met a lot of these people and i like that she didn't name drop or brag but she gives honest assessments of at least they sound honest of what she thought of these people so she talks about meeting putin and um how you know what kind of person she thought he was and erdogan early on before he went all off the wall and the rest and I found that so fascinating and so interesting and I think she does a great job with this book especially because like the Hitler chapter I knew pretty much everything just from World War II stuff but also because I recently read a frequent trouble all the frequent troubles of our days by Rebecca Donner for the book two prize and that is all about the rise of the Nazi party in Germany so it was rehash but she made it interesting and she boils everything down to the most important bits without and all the important bits are there without much extraneous stuff and that's a skill so i was incredibly impressed by this and so after all that historic stuff she gets up to for what was then 2018 modern times and she talks about trump and how he slots in with all of this stuff and i mean it's right there in the title it's a warning so I thought this was very well done, four stars. Um, just what an amazing woman she was. I'm sad that she's gone. I didn't, I remember her passing, but I didn't realize it was only a few months ago. Time has no meaning anymore, but I'm really glad I listened to her read this on audiobook. It's a good experience. I finished it in like 24 hours. I think I bumped it up to a little over double speed and the whole audiobook is 10 hours, so. If you're looking for something in this vein it's a good place to start so those are the books i've read so far this month and if you saw my hello june vlog you know that i'm doing readathon bingos and stuff this month this is the all month bingo which is actually the only one worth mentioning because some of the stuff i ended up dnfing some books and nobody's princess none of the characters are queer so it didn't count here i only have two squares filled in for blank canvas i'm hoping to get a few more done it would be cool to get a bingo but i don't worry too much about these it's for fun it's to kind of expand what i'm doing queer lit readathon tried that's where the dnf books fell unfortunately and then just starting this week as i'm filming this is the queer love romance readathon so hopefully the book i'm reading now will fit for some of these so that's how things are going with me how are things going with you how is your reading so far this month let me know down in the comments below as well as if you'd like to talk about any of these books whatsoever or just say hi i love saying hi uh thank you for watching subscribe if you're new and i'll see you in the next video bye